Ahora, Julian Sfair compartirá recomendaciones para equipos que están interesados en conocer cómo la analítica de datos puede ayudarles no solo en su desempeño deportivo, sino también para mejorar la relación con sus fans y en sus esfuerzos de comercialización. So for the first three quarters of the presentations, they were mostly around Moneyball, which is how do you scout better players, how do you get more wins, and of course, um, how do you just make a better overall on-field performance. So um, how this came to be was, um, you know, oftentimes Liga MX and the Mexican soccer clubs, they're always compared to MLS and much other things, and we look to see how everyone's doing in the world, who's progressing forward and who is not. Um, Depending on who you ask, some people will say that Mexican football is falling a little bit behind in certain things. Um, but this is just some basic practices that you can do from a commercialization aspect in order to um, push the agenda and to work on the commercialization side to start to transform yourself into becoming leaders in um, the football world. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a three times uh, master's student currently, and I currently just started off at law school. I was a mechanical engineer, um, and then I made the transition over to Moneyball Data Science. I originally started on um, the Moneyball side, and then uh, more recently did commercialization side. And what I do that's very unique that not many people in the world really do is that I bridge the gap between the two of them. Um, how does your on-field performance affect your off-field commercialization capabilities? Um, I used to be a data scientist for all of these different um, federations, clubs. I even did a bit of ice hockey as well. Uh, the ones in red are the kind of the big highlights. Founded the largest um, Moneyball um, department in the world across any sport in the history of sports. Uh, worked in this past World Cup for a confidential football federation. Um, we helped one of the underdog teams get to the final four, um, do amazing things and build a bunch of craziness. Um, and the last one is that I worked at 777 Partners as a senior data scientist on the commercialization side of things. Um, I worked in their data department and um, just finished that up very recently. So since I have no shame, there's my little Gilbert. Um, so quick shout out to him. Uh, <laughs> and I guess lastly, I, I'm currently based in Miami. So if you ever want to come visit, just let me know. So establishing the domain knowledge for all of this. Um, this presentation is meant to be agnostic, so I'm not digging into clubs specifically uh, to the point where you could not apply the same findings to the leagues or to the federations as well. Um, if you want to get to that level, please contact me afterwards. Happy to chat for as long as you want, um, and I mean as long as you want. So if you're in this room and you're attending this data science conference, you probably already know this statement ahead of you. What you probably don't know is the one that follows, which is, most clubs only utilize about 5% of their data. And I say utilize because they have the data. They have all these data vendors that collect the data for them. They are scattered across many different sources and nobody really bothers to pull them together and create the beautiful insights that come from them. So lots of untapped potential that is left on the table. And so this really becomes a very important thing because once you start to pull all these things together, you get some really beautiful insights about who your audience is and what do they care about. And so how this really pertains to the real world and uh, real world applicability is whenever you're creating um, commercial interactions, it's very important that you know whoever you're partnering with, your sponsorship, your licensing, whatever it may be, knows these things or knows these things about you. So talking about the Spotify Camp New LAFC and the MLS. So first let's talk about Camp New. So who here has heard about Camp New? So talking about the underperformance side of things, um, you know, to give a little bit of context around the situation in 2021, the club faced some major financial um, issues and they actually almost went bankrupt. They needed to come up with a large amount of money in order to stay afloat. Um, so they did everything that they could in order to create immediate revenue, including selling the naming rights to their beautiful stadium which is very historic. It holds 99,000 people. So it's one of the largest stadiums in the world as well. Um, and so they created a um, deal with, FC Bar um, with Spotify for about $5 million per year. So, you know, that could be a lot, that may not be a lot. It really depends, right? Because everything is relative. So we start to compare it to other instances in the market to see like, okay, well, did they really get the best deal possible that they reasonably could have? So we take the comparison of LAFC and we look at that. So a stadium that was much less um, well known. I mean, I'm a sports professional and before they changed the name of the stadium, heck, I didn't even know what it was called. 
Um, it's a fifth of the size. And instead of having a worldwide brand that Barcelona does, they have a semi-national brand. So they haven't even taken over the entire nation. Now, for a club like LAFC, of course, there are a couple of different dynamics, but the generality was that um, they had a better contract that you know, a much more superior team in terms of the commercial potential um, had over twice as long. And for each year, um, literally double. That's phenomenal. So how does a small club in the United States outperform and out, um, well, I guess outperform one of the most um, famous clubs in the world? Right? So it comes down to that, um, who is your data, uh, sorry, who's your audience and what do they care about? So a part of the negotiations, um, Spotify found that they actually had better quality data on the Barcelona fans than Barcelona did. So that becomes quite a big problem, as you could imagine, um, because in the negotiation, in negotiations, the transfer of power, you really don't want that to be the case where you need someone more than they need you, right? So from the first context up there, it was already very clear to the world that Barcelona needed money, so that already did not play into their favor in the negotiations, and that uh, uh, Spotify had superior um, data quality on the Barcelona fans, which also, once again, made it that um, Barcelona needed Spotify more than Spotify needed Barcelona. So there's a little bit of context behind um, the, how that ended up happening. So data quality and having a great understanding of your data is tremendously important, as we see with the underperformance example. An example of excellence, so the contrast of that, is with MLS, right? So they just signed a huge $2.5 billion of stretching over 10 years, <laughs> excuse me, streaming deal with um, uh, Apple TV, right? So MLS has made some really great investments towards um, data science, professionalization of um, certain roles that were once thought to be luxuries that are now necessities, and have done some really amazing things in terms of building up that data maturity. So their prior contract um, was for much, much less. It was literally a third, um, sorry, that should say 90 million per year. Um, oh, yeah. Um, and so by increasing their performance, increasing their data maturity, they were able to triple the value of their streaming um, going forward. Now, there were a bunch of other things that are happening in the background. So it's not just, it's not fully data maturity as to why these things occur. But these are a huge factor into why the numbers are behind me. So talking about data maturity, let's dive into it a little bit more. So first, we need to lay down some of the um, common terminology that's used in commercialization. So you have things like C2C, B2B, um, B2A, A is administration, but usually it's government. Okay, And you have some examples underneath each of them to um, help bolster the, the new terminology that you have. right? So common ones that I'm going to be looking at from a commercialization standpoint are going to be the B2C over here, which is things like ticketing, merchandise, anything that we're really trying to sell to the customer. Then you have other engagements like C2C, where let's say, oh, I don't know, Rodrigo buys a ticket and then he decides to resell it on StubHub and Pedro decides to buy it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then you have other ones which are a bit newer, um, like Socios, which is C2B. So how do you get the customer to... Um, invest money into the club um, and they use like a, I guess the best way would be like a pseudo cryptocurrency. Anyway, enough of me rambling about this, you kind of get the idea. So in order to create data maturity, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort. It's not just something that you can go out and buy overnight. So Bryce had talked about, um, you know, you can move slow, you can move fast, everything in between. Um, there's good reasons for each and there's bad reasons for each, depending on the context of your situation and what you have to work with. Um, but regardless of what you do, it takes time to aggregate all this data, right? It's not just um, you get all the season, um, all the ticket sales for your entire upcoming season. No, it's people you buy the season tickets and then they also buy the individual tickets for each game, right? Then you start to layer that with um, jersey sales that also happen over time. And so it's not just simply buy the data vendor and now it's there. It takes time for the, the database to start to uh, fill in and um, mature. So up here, we have a bunch of different um, categories for um, just general different things that you can take data on um, in order to have a fully functioning uh, data organization. Um, like I said, there are over 30, so it can get kind of messy, it can get kind of hairy, especially with the multi-club models. Um, when you acquire one of these new clubs, now you can have potentially up to 60. 
And then it's a matter of, well, do you do um, a standardization of your data vendors and then um, a data migration that comes along with it? It gets very complex. Um, it's not so fun. So um, the last bit for this is that it's really, really, really important that you spend a lot of time um, getting a great understanding and doing your due, your due diligence on data vendors. Because unfortunately, in the commercialization side of sports, there are a lot of very poor quality data vendors out there that will sell you snake oil. Um, but it, it can be some very detrimental things, like um, if you have a model that requires very up-to-date data, but the data vendor is not able to provide you with that, well, now your model is basically rendered useless. Um, and that can be very uh, detrimental, especially if you have windows of opportunity that are very time sensitive. Right? Um, another one is if you ask for a copy of your data, some of them may have poor data management practices, um, so they don't have you know, your test environments, your backup environments, and the other environments that come along with it. Um, what they will do is they'll put it all into one, and they'll actually include um, their other customers as well into that same um, database. So really poor data practices there. And so when you really need them to be great and be reliable, um, they fall at the wayside. And then, of course, that means that you are now not able to do what you were hoping and planning to do. So developing the data infrastructure, once you've selected your data vendors, fantastic. You've gotten the data sources down. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them because there's, well, over 30. But once you get to that point, now you're starting to get to the data foundation. How do we build the brick and mortar that we can then start to um, build scalable solutions, the beautiful data architecture that comes along with it? So that way we can get to the very end over here, which is BI and reporting. Um, <laughs> But here's some tips and tricks for what you can do um, if you're starting your department, right? So go all, go all in for your hiring. You find that a lot of organizations, they try to go lean um, and they try to really trim the amount of investment that they're doing before they even have any sort of proof of concept of, um, you know, did we give it a fair chance, a fair opportunity? Did we nourish it as it needed to be in order to, um, in order to flourish? So take, for instance, on the money ball side of things, a lot of clubs, they'll only invest in one data scientist. And as we know, the job is not just for one data scientist, it's, it's for many, it's for many. Um, and as a result of which, if you understaff and you under-resource the, the role, and you, know, you get very upset because you're not yielding the results that you were hoping for, and then instead of um, you know, now pursuing additional hirings, you just cut the program and you call it dead on arrival, which is a real travesty. So um, for a lot of these clubs, when they're first starting out, they don't have the technical expertise or the technical um, knowledge that they, they need in order to be able to evaluate a candidate that is an excellent data scientist from one that is a poor data scientist. And that's really a very big problem because there's no traditional um, and official definition for um, what an official data scientist is and what it isn't. Um, I've seen people that are data scientists that can't even do a linear regression. So um, if you don't have that technical expertise, hire an industry expert to be the one that um, is in charge of evaluating candidates. Build a proper data-centered um, operation. So a lot of times what you'll have um, is that you, in, in organizations, they'll have a data science department. They'll have the data, they start to do data engineering, they aggregate the data, all the fun stuff. Um, but you never really see anything yielded from it. The reason being is nobody really listens to what they say and what they do. It creates a lot of inflammation, a lot of frustration. Um, and it ends up being, instead of a functional, beautiful thing that generates a lot of value for your club, whether it be on or off the field, it turns into more of a, a puppet department, unfortunately. And you're just there for the sake of being there because, you know, innovation, it's a power word, keyword. Um, so in order to uh, create the, the real added value, that's the real purpose for why you're there, you need buy-in from upper management. So taking a top-down approach. Having a bottom-up approach, it works to a certain extent, but it only gets you so far, right? Because the key, key decisions that really um, make, make or break the data department, it's oftentimes from upper management. So as Rodrigo had on his, um, the, the point of infection where things really take off and do amazing stuff, or things really drop, um, is the people that make the decisions, which are oftentimes the upper management. So um, for the new hirings, right, they need to naturally be data-driven people. It is much more difficult to take somebody who is not data-driven and to teach them to become data-driven. And I know that's a very insensitive thing to say, but um, when push comes to shove and you are 
doing tons and tons of things throughout the season in the heat of the moment. They have no time for anything. The last thing that people have time to do is to set time aside to learn statistics, learn deep learning, um, and all the things that make data science data science. So having um, uh, heavy investment into the building of the operations, hiring great people, all these things, bring it all together. And then now you're able to not only um, provide end-to-end -end data services, but there's real-world implementation in the field. So building a scalable solution is also a very, very important thing. Um, a lot of clubs, they you would be surprised. The fact that they function is miraculous. Um, a lot of it is based off of just like back of napkin uh, notes and Excel spreadsheets, which when you're dealing with small amounts of data, you can get away with that. But if you're a small club and you have small data and you have ambitions to become larger than that, you have to have a solution that's going to be able to grow as you start to convert from small data to large data. So really making sure that you have a beautiful data architecture um, and then coming back to that idea of selecting great data vendors so you have great quality. <laughs> because if you don't, you're going to have to pick a new data vendor in the future. You have to do great uh, data migration. So at the very end of the day, um, if the top three have not sold you and you are in charge of finances at your club, it literally pays for itself. It justifies itself. Um, and oftentimes, unfortunately, that is the underlying key question or key feature that clubs really care about. You know, what's my ROI on it? Um, but in this case, it is a very, I would say, a reasonably safe bet to say that this will pay for itself um, at the very, very least. So getting into business intelligence, right? That BI that we had talked about before. Um, so building business intelligence. And first thing you need to discuss, well, what does it actually mean? I'm not gonna go through the official definition. Uh, it's a little bit boring. Um, but business intelligence is a very broad term. But essentially what it is, is that you're creating data tools that develop advanced business insights um, and commercialization performance, right? So how do we take all of this data, get some really beautiful insights out of it, um, employ it in the field to then make more money? And then of course, how do we track all of this? Um, not only do we boost the commercialization performance, we then track and measure to make sure that we have a good accounting of what's actually going on in the real world out there. So here are the 10 big keys of it. I'm not gonna go into each of them. You can read it on your own. Um, but it's because it's so wide of a, and broad of a definition, um, you really can't dig into much more key features um, unless you take it by a case by case situation. So here are some of the categories of business intelligence and um, we're gonna make this a little quick engagement here. We're not gonna just have me lecture you. Um, so we're gonna talk about business um, ticket sales and pricing. So who here has heard of a dynamic pricing model? So the idea behind it is that you have your supply and demand curve um, for tickets in your stadium, your venue, whatever it may be. Your supply is decently set because there's only so many seats that you can have inside the stadium. And so what you do is you fluctuate the, the, um, the price in real time, depending on how much demand that there is for the limited supply. So that way you can maximize the amount of money that you're bringing in. So you may have seen in the news, Taylor Swift sells for tickets, uh, three to $4,000, Lord knows why, but people buy it. Um, I believe Bruce Springsteen was also in trouble in the news for similar because he was charging thousands of dollars, causing outrage. Once again, people buy it. Um, there's lots of pros, there's cons to it. You can add in caveats into your model um, that take into account certain effects. Like, um, do you want to make things purposely um, less expensive than uh, what they could be? Right? There's a difference in the true nature between Taylor Swift concert and, oh, I don't know, um, uh, the Boston Celtics. And we'll talk about the Boston Celtics in a little bit. Um, Taylor Swift comes to town and then she leaves. Right? She'll come back maybe next year or whatever it may be. Whereas the Boston Celtics, they're there. They're never going anywhere and they need to tap into the same market both now and in the future. So price gouging um, and taking advantage of the temporary immediate profits that you can make off of that definitely really not worth it if you're trying to be there for the long haul for the um, localized fan base that you have. So we're going to dive into marketing. Um, so for the remainder of this, we're going to be talking about the business intelligence aspect and then how do we overlay um, data science into it? So creating the predictive um, forecast that come along with it and then creating the beautiful effect. So I love cartoons. Uh, they're very relatable. So um, we have a little quick pseudo chemistry equation here, um, but we have our little fan here, Mr. Wan, um, and he's a person, right? He's out there in the real world, he's doing his thing. He has his hobbies, his features, um, everything that really makes Wan Wan. 
Those factors can be anything from like seasonality things in terms of his purchases. Does he buy more gifts during Christmas? When is his birthday? Um, and who are his family and friends? The people that are around him that influence him on a day-to-day -day basis. Could be his household as well. You get the idea. The more and more information that you have on him, the more insights you have, the better profile that you can make, so on and so forth. So fantastic. You have great insights on your, um, on your fan. But you want to get to the point where you now start to convert that into points of sale. Because at the end of the day, you're trying to get them to buy your product. They may be interested in it, but you have to tip the scale of their interest such that it's now um, in the favor of them buying the product. It's never guaranteed, but there are things that we can do to create a catalyst for the reaction, which is marketing. Right? We start to add billboards, we start to add um, Instagram advertisements, all these different things, and basically we do everything that we can to convince him to get that tipping um, for the point of sale. So that way he now buys the club, um, uh, the America jersey, right? or whatever team he's rooting for. So basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to capture what the motives are, and keeping in mind those motives can be unique. The reason why Pedro likes the team and the reasons for why his motives are for why he would buy something from the team are different than Santiago. And if you're like Juan, your purchases may change over time, you know, seasonality, it's the holidays, it's your birthday, you get older, things that you cared about before you may not care about now, and vice versa. And so um, think about it like this. Juan is just one fan. Think of how many fans the Club America has, the many millions, if you're Barcelona and you're a worldwide brand even more millions, um, and it can be really very difficult to get to know each and every one of these fans at an intimate level um, at the mass level. And so that's where the beauty of um, computing comes into play. Um, we're able to now start to provide that mass um, uniqueness for each of the individuals and cater to their individual needs while doing that for thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds, millions, um, all at once. So as I had promised, we were talking about the Boston Celtics. So they do something that's called a fan 360 profiling. Um, it's a very common practice in the industry. I just had a chat with the Boston Celtics that brought it up there, so I figured why not talk about it here. So they do what's called a fan segmentation. They create profiles for all the millions of people that are in their fan base, and they segment it based on um, the traditional methodologies and then um, artificial intelligence methodologies as well. So for traditional methodologies, you're looking at things that are like motive-based and profile-based. So motive-based is like, what are the people probably going through right then? Um, is there an individual um, potentially upcoming demand? You know, there's only a certain window of opportunity. There's only so many days before Christmas. Um, and then there's other things that are more physical based, like are, what's your age, what's your, your gender, your geographic location, all those different things, right? I'm not gonna try to sell you tickets if you are um, on a different continent. It just doesn't make sense. Then you have the AI version. Right, so how do we shoot it up on steroids and make it into something really amazing? So in this case, we're looking for things that the human eye really can't see and looking for different correlations and segmentations for how we divide up that fan base. Um, which is why oftentimes, like if you, oh, I don't know, if you uh, subscribe to, let's say, a fishing newsletter, you'll find an advertisement for your local soccer team in there. The reason may be for your um, specific population and your fan base and everything, that they're avid um, fishing enthusiasts. Who knew? Until you look at the data. Um, and as I always say, it's only crazy if it doesn't work. So getting to a little bit more detailed, um, we can talk about what the New York Giants do. Once again, this is also another common industry practice. Everybody's algorithm is a little bit different. So they're always trying to push for the best one. But it's called um, dynamic hyper-personalized marketing. So going back to that idea of each and every person has different motives, different profiles, and things of that sort. Um, if I'm creating a marketing campaign that's static, I'm just trying to put one message out there, it may engage Santiago, it may also disengage Pedro, because the reason why each of them likes the club is different than the other. If I push the wrong bit of information to you, it's actually going to disengage you because it seems that I'm not genuine in what I do. Right? Now, we can create those dynamic and personalized um, events, so that way we figure out what you're looking at, or what you're needing, and we provide that to you in terms of um, Instagram advertisements, whatever outreach it may be that we choose to get to you. And that's going to be different than the information and the content that we are going to publish to Pedro because we want Pedro to feel that um, he's well engaged and that we understand what his wants, his needs are, and that we are going to fulfill them. But too much is too much. 
So let's take the example of Bryce over here. Bryce, if I try to sell you a jersey for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, right, because you're in the Tampa area, okay, maybe I can convince him, maybe not. Um, and I can say, hey, we're a winning team. Back when we had Tom Brady, we were doing amazing stuff. We just won the Super Bowl. People will buy a Super Bowl hat. Why not? Um, and it may be that Bryce just simply likes the team because they win. So that's an easy one. We say, hey, we just won the Super Bowl, buy our stuff, and Bryce will say, oh, yeah, why not? Now, a little bit more personal information about Bryce. He just has a newborn. Um, now, if I go to Bryce and I say, hey, Bryce, um, heard you got a newborn. We have the New York Giant or the Tampa Bay Buccaneers um, baby accessories. Would you like to buy one? You may be creeped out by that because you're going to think to yourself, how the hell do you know that I just had a kid? Right? So there is such a thing as too much personalization um, because once you get to the point where people start to make that connection of where are these people getting this information on me, how do they know these things, then it falls off a cliff really quickly, right? So you want to, I don't want to say you can flirt with it, you want to come reasonably close to it, but the moment um, you get too far over it, you're going to completely disengage your fans. So here's three examples of um, different targeted um, uh, advertisements that the New York Giants puts out. So one is for fans that are more of, you know, what free things can I get, right? Sometimes they'll give you like a bobblehead, uh, different tchotchkes, different strokes for different, po uh, different folks, as they say. Some people like the nostalgia from back when they won the Super Bowl. Um, and uh, that's Eli Manning down there, who was their quarterback. And then you have Odell Beckham Jr. And then for some people, um, I don't know, Ernesto, how much do you care about the NFL draft? Okay, so because you love it, right, I'm going to push that advertisement for you. But I guarantee you almost everyone in the room does not care about the NFL draft. It's a very niche thing that only a certain amount care about. So, of course, I'm going to push that to you. I may push a different advertisement to Dave, and then I may push a different one to Luis in the back over there. So, that's great. I know who you are. I know what your motives are. And I have a good amount of business intelligence that's about you. Now, I need to go out and I start reaching to you now that I know what content I need to push to you. So, way back when, it used to be the single channel. Um, then we started to have the multi-channel, right? Different ways in reaching out to people. Then in the marketing world, we started to get to cross-channel, which is, okay, you know, we need to start to tether these together. And then we get to the omni-channel, which is now the most sophisticated of what we have, basically showing that the different methodologies in which we outreach to you as the individual now affect one another. So how much do I invest in Instagram ads? How much do I invest in LinkedIn ads? How much do I invest in a billboard, TV advertisement, so on and so forth? And then how does each of them tie together and affect one another? Right, so you can look at neural networks and see how everything uh, pulls together with deep learning. So lastly, for my examples, um, I like to end with the gold standard. So if you, you know, just need a general target for where you're trying to aim towards, uh, 601 Analytics is a good one. Um, I had a meeting with them maybe four months ago, and they're really fascinating people, very friendly. Um, and what they do is they create a all-in-one Power BI, um, I believe it's Power BI based, but it's a BI um, platform. And the really amazing part about it is that it's accessible for whoever they give access to within an organization. Um, and it can be on their phone, it can be on a laptop, it can be on a tablet, wherever it is. Basically, whoever has access to it, wherever they have a means of accessing it, can start to get some really beautiful data insights. Right? Of course, the insights are only as good as the data from the data vendors that you have. You see how this starts to all come in uh, one big circle here. So that can be really amazing because if you have a general manager or if you have a team owner that is very well data driven and data versed, you know, they have incredible power at their fingers. Um, if you want to learn more about 601, I make no money from this plug whatsoever. They also have a great website. Go check it out. Um, they have some good videos um, that show what the gold standard practice is. So um, this is a very, very undervalued topic and this is something that really needs to be at the forefront of what you're doing if you decide that you're going to get into this stuff. Um, data privacy laws, whenever you're dealing with this type of data, you're working with PII data, personally identifiable information. So that's people's birthdays, it's their full names, it's their addresses, it's their livelihood really just written down in your database. If somebody were to get a hold of that data, they can do a lot of harm to them and they can uh, hold you legally accountable for it, right? And that's not a cheap lawsuit to have against you. So there's data privacy laws out there. Um, they're all different ones uh, across the world, right? GDPR over in Europe, LGPD, if you're in Brazil, you get the idea. You are responsible for abiding by all of these different um, 
data, uh, foreign data protection laws. So if I own a soccer club in North America, and somebody, well, let's say I'm based in Nevada, right? And somebody buys a soccer jersey, but they live in California. I have to abide by California data privacy laws. Um, if not, I am legally accountable for that. Same can be said if I have fans come over from Europe, they're in town, they go win a lot of money in Vegas, and then they go buy a box seat, whatever it may be. Their billing address is European, they're a European citizen, and you are responsible for abiding by GDPR. Now, I'm not gonna dig too much into this because you can go very, very down the rabbit hole very quickly and never come back up. So um, whenever you're building out these data departments on the commercialization side, get legal consultation very, very early on in the process. Um, and note that as things change over time and you plan to do new projects, you need to update your terms and conditions for your data, um, basically what the customers are signing off on every time they click that accept all terms, right, for the cookies or whatever it may be. And just in case I haven't already sold you on this, um, data privacy laws and penalties are getting much, much more harsh by the day, and they don't really seem to be letting up at all. So here's one from Australia. Um, and these are the three different options for the penalties. And of course, with legislation, it's always whatever the worst penalty is, is the one that you are assigned. So the middle one there is really, really a killer if you um, don't do well in terms of keeping your data privacy. So what they'll do is they'll do an audit for whatever data violations you had, any sort of profits that you made off of that illegally sourced information or malprotected, whatever it may be, triple that revenue, and you now have to pay that back, right? That can kill your company. That can kill your organization very quickly. So this is not a joking matter to, um, to really take lightly. Anyway, so um, one of the things I always like to end with is like, all right, well, there's all these problems, problems if you're the um, organization, opportunity if you're the one that's looking to solve the problem. So if you don't already have the skills that are required to solve the problem, here's how you can start to learn it, right? It's not a traditional thing. Getting data sets for ticketing data are, is not something that you will be able to get in the public. So you have to do the best that you can to prepare yourself for um, that upcoming interview that you may have, right? So understanding the domain knowledge of how the sport works. You need to know the intricacies of soccer, not football, uh, of how the soccer world operates and functions. There are things that make sense. There are things that don't make sense. There are a lot of things that don't make sense, but we still do anyway. Um, and you need to know how these work and how these affect um, what you do. And then, like I said, being well-versed in your data vendors. So if you're looking at ticketing, you better know who Ticketmaster is. You better know who StubHub is, all of these different vendors, um, because they're going to come up in your interviews for questions and you will be using it day in and day out. And then, of course, you need to know the traditional aspect of whatever discipline of the commercialization you are going into because you're probably going to have to work with a lot of these people um, day in and day out. And they may not know the data science side of things. So you have to be the one that bridges the data science and the traditional knowledge. And I guarantee you, somewhere up the food chain, someone that you report to definitely does not know data science. So you definitely need to be able to speak the lingo to them in order to get what you have um, uh, in terms of data insights implemented out in the field. So here we are with the Q&A. And as a quick reminder, these are all the different topics that we had talked about.